I'm Georgia Hunter, and this is the story behind my story. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O. Brandon Sanderson, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Tim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Georgia Hunter. Happy New Year 2018, everybody. Uh, Thanks for joining me these last four years and nearly 300 episodes uh, as I try to bring you some of the very best author interviews with the best folks writing today. Thanks to all of our sponsors who make this show possible. Uh, It's because of them that we get to keep doing this, so uh, I want to thank some of them real quick. Uh, We're going to talk about all of these sponsors in great detail in the uh, next few shows, but I wanted to uh, start the year off by telling you who they are and to thank them. And uh, if you would like to sponsor the show, go to hanggarner.com. There's a link up at the top menu bar where you can do that. Nick Breaker is uh, a faithful sponsor, and I want to thank him especially as we kick off this new year. Uh, Craig Martell, Armand Rosamelia, Crystal Pico Watanabe from uh, Pico's House, one of my favorite editors out there. Crystal does a fantastic job. Please look her up. Uh, Chuck Buddha, Bokira Brumley, Liberty Island Media, Patricia Gilliam, and Daniel Kinney. And as always, Richard Gleaves uh, will have an audio book clip at the end of the show. You can find the links to all these sponsors in the show notes at today's episode over at hankgarner.com. And uh, don't worry, we're going to tell you all about them in great detail coming up in the next few shows. Uh, but let's go ahead and jump into today's show. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Georgia Hunter on the show with me. Georgia has a new book called We Were the Lucky Ones, and it is absolutely amazing. I can't wait for each of you to go pick it up uh, because I think you're going to love it uh, like I have. And uh, without further ado, welcome to the show, Georgia. Thanks, Hank. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, I'm excited to have you. Um, I, I begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Oh, that's a great question. Well, my father is a writer, was a writer when I was growing up, and so one of my earliest memories is the sound of his typewriter. He had one of those old school typewriters where you type out the line, you hit enter, and it goes bang, 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 (laughs) and types out the line. And he worked from home, and we had a small house in the woods in Massachusetts, and I remember hearing the sound of that typewriter over and over and over again. And he penned his first novel when I was about three. So that's a pretty early memory for me. And I also remember the book coming out uh, maybe a year or so later and seeing the actual you know, book in its real tangible form and realizing all that noise, all that ruckus he was making was for this purpose. (laughs) (laughs) The, the, the slap of the, of the letters against the page and that ding Mm -hmm. at the end of the line over and over again. Yeah. Look what it turned into his novel. It's a sci-fi novel called softly walks the beast. And, uh, and I, and I mentioned this in my author's note, but I, um, my first book when I was five years old and just learning how to write, I called it Charlie walks the beast. So as you can (laughs) tell, it was pretty inspired by my father. (laughs) I love that. I absolutely love that. Um, so, um, your dad was, was a sci-fi writer. Um, well, yeah, he's, he's a, a real creative guy. He was actually a screenwriter. He's written a couple of movies and, um, an actor. And so by the time I came around, he had kind of shifted to writing books and novels. He's written a a memoir as well. So yeah, he's, he's definitely given me the writing gene, I think. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm always amazed, uh, because there, there are so many stories that I've heard, um, of people, that, uh, you know, there was someone in their life that recognized that, that storytelling gene and gave them just the right encouragement at just the right time that kind of propelled them to a life of creativity. And sometimes it's a school teacher, sometimes it's a parent. Um, but I hear that over and over and over again, that, that someone recognized that. And if it weren't for that person, 
then you know you may not have wound up where you are. Um, but you know it's a it's a rare thing when when you have someone who watches their parents do the do this over and over again, and you know sort of by osmosis it uh, it becomes yeah. normal the normal thing to do. Um, it's a book. Yeah, yeah, did, did which is you... not normal for the for the average person. But I get, yeah, you're right. I didn't know any different. You know, that was that was that was my normal growing up. And I I do thank him a lot for that because it's and, and certainly the encouragement from both of my parents. Um, my mom is also got a lot of creativity in her work too, and always of course inspired me. I think they both encouraged me. I was 11, I think, when they encouraged me to write a an article for like an op ed piece and submit it to the local newspaper. So I think it was just. Just something you did, you wrote, and you got it out there. Why not? <laughs> did Did you talk about uh, writing and storycraft, or was it just kind of around? It was more just kind of around. Um, you know, I, I loved. I went to this great school in Providence, Rhode Island, called the Gordon School, and I do remember in first grade we published our first books, and we. Um, you know, we, we we did the covers and we bound them and then we put them in the library for other kids to read. And it was um, just one of those things where you it was a, there was a lot of emphasis put um, on the fact that we could do this. You know, books weren't just for grownups. And, I, you know, we'd go to the library and pick out other books, you know, the, the bound, you know, professionally printed books to read and take home with us. But I remember vividly walking in and seeing my book, you know, very handmade book on the shelf and thinking, wow, cool. You know, my, my work fits in here too somewhere. Um, so that, that was also, you know, they, they definitely encouraged from a very early age that sense of, of creative thought and then kind of bringing it through fruition and then presenting it for other people to read. So I could give my, this is Johnson, my first grade teacher credit for that. <laughs> I love it. Um, did you uh, did you have any idea what you wanted to do uh, when when you grew up? Uh, what was writing uh, on your horizon, or did you think you wanted to go do something else? You know, it was always a passion. I loved to write, and I took classes through high school and through college. But I knew it was something that I was felt like I was born to do, and that I would you know write a novel someday. Um, I studied psychology at the University of Virginia. Uh, I'm, I love kind of human interaction. I'm fascinated by that. And I loved my classes. Uh, but e even going into that, I can't say I necessarily wanted to be in social work or I, I just was more fascinated by the topic. Um, so I think it was more just, especially for my, this, we were the lucky ones, my book, the real driver behind that from the very beginning when I say very beginning because it feels like a long time ago I think I set off on my first interview in 2008 um, as a story is based on my family history so I had a lot of research to do and it was really the driver was to record my ancestry to get that piece of my family story down it was not to find a publisher someday and make you know make a big deal out of this book it was to to capture the story for, for the family, for my grandfather and his siblings who had been through what they'd been through. And then also for my kids, eventually, I didn't have any when I started the book, but I hoped I would someday and <laughs> for their kids and so on, so that we could keep that, you know, piece of our history alive. Right. Um, so I, I love the idea that you, uh, that you studied psychology and, uh, you know, very few writers uh, that I've had on the show pursued writing as a profession from the very beginning and, you know, went to college, got an MFA and said, I'm going to be, you know, this amazing writer and, and I'm going to, everything I do is going to be geared toward getting me to that point. Um, that happens to very few people. Most people yeah. kind of have a meandering path that got them there. And what, I guess you could look at it that, um, and say that the writer just hadn't found their thing yet and they were uh, you know going through and, and trying things until they found it but I like to think that all of the things that we do to get to that point uh, kind of equip us and build us to be the writer that, that we need to be uh, you know studying psychology and human interaction obviously is a tool that a novelist would uh, uh, would need to have you, if you're going to write personal interaction stories you need to know how people interact um, you know and and getting out in the world and, and working and, and uh, you know living with real people uh, you know lets you get a view of the world that as the novelist you get to report on um, absolutely yeah that's interesting that you found that sort of pattern in in 
the folks that you've spoken with. I, and I should say too, I did, I did decide eventually in my profession. So I started off, you know, I was really passionate about travel um, and kind of thought I might go into the tr adventure travel world of being a guide or working for an outfitter, um, but landed a job in, in marketing and kind of spent some time doing that. And then one day at my my marketing design firm, we hired a copywriter and she sat next to me <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, wait a minute, I want to be doing what you're doing because you get to write for work. Like, that's really cool. Um, it wasn't necessarily the idea of writing a novel that struck me. It was like, okay, well, I can, I can kind of use this kind of marketing and branding and design expertise that I've garnered over the years and I can, um, use my writing skills and combine them. And so, um, maybe a year later I quit the branding and marketing job and I called, decided to call myself a freelance copywriter. And since I had a passion for travel, I targeted, um, adventure travel outfitters. And, um, I somehow managed to acquire a few clients, um, several of whom are still my clients today. So that, that was my first foray, I guess, into the professional world of writing. It's not necessarily creative writing, although certainly you have to be creative. It was writing marketing materials for these outfitters that take small groups on adventure travel, um, which didn't feel like a job, to be honest. It was so fun, still is so fun. I absolutely love it. Um, but that was sort of my first taste of writing for work. And I, I do think that I draw upon that the travel writing aspect certainly I did in my in my novel writing because there's a lot of painting settings and trying to get a reader to feel like they're there right what it feels like to be either kayaking down a river in Costa Rica or you know surviving a winter in Siberia there's some similar technique that goes into um, creating those settings so I think that's been helpful in my in my writing today as well and what I've found, Georgia, is that uh, exercising those writing muscles, uh, no matter what the form, is always good for writing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's kind of like when you go to the gym and you're you're working on your cardiovascular health and you're and you're building, uh, you know, to to make yourself stronger. And it feels like, um, you know, that you're just going through the motions until that one day when you need to rescue your family from a burning house, <laughs> and and all of a sudden those things, you know. Uh, Come in. So I, I think all writing is is good writing, uh, especially mm -hmm. for a novelist, and 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 building those muscles, learning how to get a thought across, uh, learn like you said, uh, making what seems to be mundane uh, engaging and exciting. Uh, you know, those are real skills that uh, that I think all novelists ought to try to get outside their head sometimes and build those. Yeah, agreed. Uh, when working in uh, in marketing. Uh, you know, we know for, for authors now it, on, on the business side of things, you know, you, you have to be uh, kind of savvy with uh, with getting the word out about your book and, and talking with people. And, you know, there's a marketing side that all authors have to go through. Uh, and also some of those marketing skills are, are great for novelists as well. What do you think the, the marketing side of, of your uh, education and work has uh, helped you or equipped you? Uh, to be better at as a writer or you know, on the business side of, of being a writer? Um, that's a good question. And I, I, I recognize the importance of it. Um, and to be honest with you, this has been so new to me, this whole um, ride from draft to somewhat of a manuscript to polished manuscript to finding an agent to um, finding a publisher and then going through this, you know, bringing the book you know, to the public. Um, and they really, Viking has just taken me and this book under their wing. And I can't speak highly enough of, of my team there, the marketing and publicity teams, my editor, um, and my agent as well. They've been so helpful because I'm a complete newbie at this. I mean, I, <laughs> this is all brand new to me. Um, and so I do feel like they give me a lot of direction and I guess I just kind of understand the importance of, um, just standing behind your work and, and talking about it in a very authentic way. There's something about branding. I think maybe one of the biggest takeaways from my branding and, and marketing work was that if you try to be something you're not, even if you're advertising a product, if you're trying to present it as something it's not, it's not going to go over well. People are going to see right through it. So I remind myself all the time because I'm not, you know, I didn't grow up a public speaker. I'm not 
I, I don't actually personally love the idea of like trying to get out there and sell my book. But if I think of it as instead of that, I think of it as me just talking about my story and my fan. It's so personal to me, right? Because it's my family story. Um, then it's easy because I, that's my passion and that's, I'm, I couldn't be more excited to talk about it. And I think that does shine through. I, I get a lot of feedback from my, after my talks, like, wow, you just spoke so, so authentically and so passionately about, about your whole experience. Well, and of course I did because <laughs> it, it really has been a labor of love for the last decade. And, um, and I enjoy sort of peeling back the layers of the research and, and diving deep into that. And for audiences, they, they appreciate that. So I guess that kind of understanding that piece of it from my marketing world that just be genuine and get like the real heart of what, what your story is about or marketing, maybe what your product or your company is all about. We had this, I worked for this great company in Atlanta called Bright House and we, every client that we worked with, we had to find their master idea, which was basically getting down to their ethos. Like why was the company founded from the very, very first start? So we worked with like Georgia Pacific and Delta, like big companies. We had to go way back. We would dig through their archives and talk to people who might shed some insight into who started this company and why, and then bring that quote unquote master idea to life through marketing and design and branding. But it all had to start with that sort of nugget of truth, but that has, you know, it may have evolved, but it starts there. And so I guess that's my biggest takeaway too, is why did I write this book? It's my family and it has to start there. I think that's brilliant. And, uh, and speaking of that, take us back to, to, um, the, the kernel, uh, that, that this grew out of, um, this is a, a in, inspired by a, a family history story of yours. Uh, how did you learn about this and, and what is the, um, uh, what what's the story uh, that that happened to your family that inspired you to take this project on? Sure. Well, uh, I guess I'll answer it um, sort of in two different ways. I have another teacher to credit um, because this piece of my family history it's, it's a Holocaust survival story, but I actually had no idea it existed um, until I was fifteen. It wasn't some big secret. It just was not talked. It was just not. It was a piece of my grandfather's past that he had put behind him. He also was pretty sick by the time I was like 11 or 12. Um, and I don't know, I just, as a kid growing up, I was pretty self-centered, as I think a lot of us are. And it wasn't, I wasn't thinking about my grandfather's ancestry. I had no idea that he um, had grown up in Poland, actually. He had become an American as soon as he got here, and I never heard an accent. So when I was 15, I... Actually, he had passed away the year before, and my high school English teacher, um, Ransom Griffin, assigned our class a what he called an eye search project. So we had to go and interview a relative to learn a little bit about our our roots and in turn about ourselves. And I sat down with my grandmother Caroline, who you meet at the in the book, and um, my grandparents lived a mile from me growing up, so we were close. It's not like I never saw never saw them. We were very close, actually. Um, so with my grandfather's memory so fresh, I sat with my grandmother and it was over the course of that interview that I discovered that I was a quarter Jewish and that I came from this family of Holocaust survivors. So as you can imagine, that was a pretty, um, shocking uh, discovery. Um, and, and it led to a lot of questions. And from there, um, unfortunately, my grandmother wasn't able to answer too, too many of them because my grandfather was actually the only one of his family living in France at the start of the war. The other family uh, were Pol Polish and they were in Poland. He had four siblings, parents, a little baby niece. So I kind of figured, and when I asked my grandmother to tell me, oh, well, how did they survive? I knew enough from my Holocaust studies that their, their odds were not good. And she said, well, I know that your grandfather managed to get out on one of the last boats from Marseille to Brazil. He got detained along the way. He actually met a, a woman along the way who luckily, for my sake, he didn't end up with. But they were <laughs> engaged to a Czechoslovakian woman. And um, she told me some little snippets of his story and how he ended up in Brazil. But he lost touch for the remainder of the war for six years with his lost touch for, with his family and didn't know if he'd ever see them again. And... Um, so I didn't, when I asked her about the other families, she said, you know, like your grandfather, they really didn't talk about their wartime experiences. So she, she wasn't able to answer those questions. Um, and it would be another, I guess, five years um, until I got 
a little bit of kind of understanding about that side of of the family story when my mom hosted a family reunion and um, invited all of her cousins on my on my grandfather's side. She's one of 10 first cousins and they all immediately agreed to come and they flew in from Brazil and from Paris and from Israel and all across the states and I think we were 32 and all with spouses and children and it was <laughs> complete chaos and amazingly fun. I met cousins I'd never met before and um, I remember one night I was 21, so I was still pretty young and uh, kind of at that, like in between feeling like a grown up and feeling like a kid, I was off to college, uh, just, just graduated from college off to the real world. And one night I decided I was going to hang out with the, the grown ups, the older generation. And I, and I wandered out to the back porch where they were all sitting and sat down and started listening as they were telling stories. And that night was when I started hearing little bits and pieces of sort of the greater Kirk family saga, which just blew my mind. Like I'd never heard anything like them before. Like one of the cousins at the table had been born in Siberia, but he didn't know why his parents had been sent there. He didn't even know what his birthday was. Uh, he just said, his mom said it was so cold that when he woke up as a baby, his eyes would be frozen shut and she would have to use her breast milk to coax them open. Like things like that. Uh, another cousin talked about how her mom had hiked over the Alps while pregnant. One talked about a secret wedding in a blacked out house. You know, there were disguised circumcisions. That were, like these stories were getting thrown around. And I remember sitting there blinking and, and thinking, how have I never heard any of this before? And how has no one taken the time to write these stories down? And I can't say I left say, thinking, okay, I'm going to write the book. But I think it was that reunion in the year of 2000 that the idea was seeded and then would kind of grow slowly <laughs> until I couldn't ignore it any longer. Um, and then I finally, like I said, it was 2008 when I set off for my first interview. I kind of put a stake in the ground and said, all right, this is something I need to do and, and just set off to, to research it and record it. So your your mother um, never talked about this uh, the story of your dad or of of her dad's and uh, evidently he never talked about it to to anyone. Uh, he, but this this was not a a story passed down in your immediate family. It was not, you know. And part of it, he married my grandmother is Presbyterian from the American South. Um, he made the choice not to raise his family Jewish when he got here. I think partly because he'd seen what you know being Jewish had could have should have done for his family back in Europe I think it was his way of protecting them um, he did the interestingly some of the family that remained in Brazil and that's now in France um, did retain the Jewish faith and so he would travel back and maybe go for a Passover and celebrate with the family but he didn't talk about it at home my mom said she was aware that he was born in Poland she knew that he had family some family in Brazil and a, a sister Helena who he adored um, but he he didn't talk about that piece. he might mention like his mother's challah bread or he might he was a musician so she said she would notice that he would count to keep time in Polish but that was essentially it so again it wasn't like it was my mom my poor mom <laughs> she gets a lot of heat at these in at these talk book talks when she comes like why didn't you tell her it wasn't some huge secret it just really wasn't something my grandfather wanted to relive. And therefore we talked about things that were happening now and things that would happen in the future. I mean, he was so consumed with creating a, a you know, stable and safe life for his family, which he did. Um, so I wish, I wish I'd had the chance to ask him these questions, but no, it was not, it was not something passed down through him. I had to then uh, interview mostly second generation relatives to get this story down. Well, you know, it was this this really interesting um, uh, kind of thought process for a lot of early immigrants. I know some of my great grandparents were immigrants from from Ireland and from uh, uh, from different parts of Europe, and when they came to America, it's like they just shed off all that old stuff, and now they're Americans. And it, what yeah. happened in the past didn't matter. We're moving forward from here on. And, yeah. and that stuff is, is forgotten and gone. And, yeah. uh, you, you know, I, I, I you know, is a couple of generations later, we're really interested in where we came from. Mm -hmm. But for them, they're like, it doesn't matter where we came from. It only matters where we're going now. Starting over. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So crazy. Um, so you're, you're 21 and you start to really, 
um, hear these stories for the first time. And I'm, I'm imagining that your imagination is just wide open <laughs> at this point. What a, what a great age, uh, to, to discover these things, because like you said, you're, 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 you're older than a kid, but not quite cynical enough, um, you know, as, as adults <laughs> get to be, um, you know, what did you, did you start seeing that this was a, uh, that this was a passion that you were going to have to, you know, dig deep and, and find all, all that you could about it? I did. And I think that's a great way to put it. Like I did not have the cynicism and I didn't have any kind of resentment or anger towards the family for not talking about it. I was just so curious. I suppose as my research went on and it took so long to uncover the stories that I maybe felt a little bit of frustration here and there thinking that would be so much easier if I could just ask my grandfather or his brothers and sisters. But that was, I mean, I kind of just put on my detective hat and I just, um, yeah, it, it was, it was certainly, I've never been more curious or inspired to learn about something in my life. And it was just, it wasn't like, oh, should I do this? Or how am I going to, it was like, no, I'm doing this. It may take a while, <laughs> a decade, but I'm going to do that. And I'm going to figure it out. And I'm going to piece this story together. Um, just, I have to. It, yeah, it was just sort of this, a, a piece of me that I knew I had to, I had to do it. And I'm so glad I did. And it wasn't easy, but it was rewarding. And yeah. Um, it kept me going. As are most things in life that are worth yeah. anything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so where did your research lead you? Oh, my gosh. Well, it started in Paris. Um, as I mentioned, my grandfather had a niece um, named Felicia, who you meet in the book. And she was one year old at the start of the war. Um, so she I was living in Paris, and she's still there today. And she's the first one I wanted to speak with because I knew she'd had firsthand memories. And her her it was, and that was the hardest interview to be honest because she obviously her memories were uh, dark, and she had and her stories when you read them they're almost unbelievable. Like you cannot fathom a three year old, a four year old. Um, hiding, staying quiet, being forced to experience what she did. So her memories were very vivid um, and, and difficult, but I took my, a lot of time and was very gentle with that approach. Um, I had a couple other relatives in France. I have family in Brazil. So I went there to Rio to interview them, uh, California, Miami. So I tried to talk to anyone and everyone in the family who had a story to share I also, um, I actually tracked down the ex fiance of my grandfather because I knew oh, that nice. they, <laughs> yeah, they had remained close and long story of how I found her, but, um, she was living in Chapel Hill and I flew down with my mom and we spent two days with Aliska and we sat with her and that was magic because she was able to share what it was like to be, she was maybe 18. My grandfather was in his mid twenties, but what it was like to be this refugee with a one way ticket and on a boat and then the boat getting detained in Dakar and in Casablanca and their visas expiring and them sneaking off to the beaches. And, you know, it was just incredible. Her eyes definitely still kind of lit up when she talked about my grandfather and it was, it was amazing. Her memory was so sharp. And then once I kind of exhausted the oral history piece of it, so who could pass down, you know, actual stories. Um, I did a, a pretty exhausted uh, record search. So anywhere that I felt like might have a record uh, pertaining to my family, whether it was an archive, a town magistrate, a, a museum, um, several relatives ended up fighting for the Polish army, which fell under the British army. So I found military records. Uh, amazingly, through the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, I was able to find a handwritten document from my, my grandfather's older brother, Genick, who had, he was the one who was sent to Siberia. So he's the one who had a baby in Siberia. And I found a record in his hand, nine pages long, that described exactly why he was arrested in Poland and when he was sent to Siberia, where he was sent, the name of the camp, what he was doing, he and his wife, Hertha, the day his son was born. So then all of a sudden, Jose has a birthday. Uh, it, why they were released, where they went to join the army. It was incredible. Um, and I should also mention in my research, I had access to three Shoah interviews. And sh the Shoah Foundation is Steven Spielberg's initiatives where he um, put uh, Holocaust survivors in front of video cameras and, and recorded their stories. So amazingly, I did have three relatives 
um, that I could literally like see and hear talking about their stories. So throughout that process of oral histories, outside research, I kind of pieced together this massive, massive timeline and I color coded it by sibling and I peppered in also historic detail because this was a pretty big refresher in, um, in history for me. Uh, what was going on at the time because I also had to keep reminding myself that the family, they, they were living day to day. They weren't necessarily aware of what was happening politically, uh, military, from a military standpoint. Uh, they had no idea what was going to happen. So I didn't want to bog the story down in those details, but it was really important for me to have them as kind of context. So in the end, it was it was so helpful for me that I ended up keeping some of those historical um, snippets in between chapters, also for readers to kind of feel like their the story was grounded in, in history and what was going on at the time. Um, but uh, yeah, so from there, the timeline kind of, once I felt it was complete enough, I had every narrative, I had every path to survival that each relative had taken, then it was time to uh, to do the writing itself. So then came the chapter outlines and bit by bit, the manuscript came together. Um, this book, We Were the Lucky Ones, is the book. Uh, it, it's a novel, um, but it, as you've mentioned several times, there are real characters that, that are, are are real people, relatives of yours that that uh, that show up in the book. Um, is, is this a um, is this a, a historical fiction that includes your family? Uh, is this uh, just informed by your family, or uh, kind of how did you? I guess the question I'm asking is um, where did you take liberties uh, in the novelization of this, and where did you decide? to play, uh, you know, very close to the facts. Sure. Yeah. I will say I almost penned it as narrative nonfiction. Um, but because I had done so much research and it, and I really had every, every storyline, every path to survival, there are five siblings, parents, uh, niece Felicia is based on truth. So where they were and when is absolutely that's true. Pe real people, first of all, and then they're the way they managed to stay one step ahead um, is based on truth. Is their true story? Um, where I felt like I didn't necessarily feel comfortable um, creating was with, but in calling it nonfiction was sort of the more human side of it. So the dialogue. The inner dialogue. What were they thinking? What were they feeling? I didn't get to interview them firsthand. So I didn't, I took a little bit of creative license in saying, okay, Mila is a mother for the first time. Um, where I took the creative liberties um, was, so for example, say Mila, my grandfather's older sister. The way Felicia described her in my interviews was perfection. She was a hero. Um, she, as rightfully so, she saved her daughter's life on multiple occasions. She was her mother. She was her rock. But then I tried to put myself in Mila's shoes and thought, what would it have really felt like to be a mother for the first time <clears throat> with a one-year-old baby at the start of a war? Her husband has just disappeared. She's forced to make these awful decisions about where her daughter is safest in her own protection under the care of somebody else, a stranger, and I realized maybe her character would have been terrified and guilty for maybe giving up on her husband halfway through the war. <clears throat> or maybe she would have been, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm going to be <laughs> coughing one more time. Excuse me, one second. <clears throat> okay, hopefully that's the end of it. <laughs> no, no worries. <clears throat> Um, I tried to put myself in Mila's shoes and in all the characters' shoes and really bring their stories to life in a very kind of less historic and more human kind of colorful way that would really allow readers to, to kind of feel like they were there, right? Because that was the, my going into it, I, I had this fear that this time in history will soon feel like ancient history. And it's such an important chapter to remember um, so I wanted the, the story itself, my book, to read a little less like a lesson in history, looking back in black and white and sort of these images we have with these unfathomable statistics and maybe sepia tone photographs and instead make it feel more relevant, more visceral, um, <clears throat> more like 
more like the family was experiencing at the time, which was in color, right? Um, so long story short, to answer your question, I, it was more that aspect that um, felt like I needed to add my own creative touch to kind of help bring that side of it to life. And I just didn't feel comfortable calling it nonfiction when I was kind of including so many of those details that were not necessarily uncovered in my research. Right. Right. Um, the, the book has been very well received, uh, not only critically, um, but, uh, readers seem to really connect with it. You know, if you look on Amazon, it's like 4.8 star yeah. uh, average. Um, you know, the, the book is really connecting with readers, which I know is, is really important to you, uh, for a story, this, uh, yeah, this uh, intimate and as, as close to you, um, but more than the critical acclaim and more than the sales and more than the the reader reviews, um, how how has your family uh, uh, felt about this book? Oh my gosh, I was so nervous to to hand them the galley. I sent them an early the early version of the book, and I can't tell you there's no other audience that I was more worried about impressing or, or hoping that they would like it. And, um, it was silly because I knew they were going to appreciate it and they loved it. Um, they've been incredibly supportive from the very first day, <clears throat> from the very first day that I sort of, that I told them I wanted to do this project and um, they all invited me into their homes and said, come stay with us and talk to us as much as you need. And I'll pull up every photograph and document that I might have at home. So they, the support and the outpouring of love that I received and kind of gratitude from the very beginning, uh, just, if anything, magnified their support of the story. They each kind of had their individual pieces, right, of they knew maybe the story of parents and a sibling, but um, they had never experienced it or read it kind of cold together like, like mine. So... Uh, they're, yeah, they're, it, I, I, I guess it, to sum it up, um, I had my book launch, uh, my very first event when the book came out in February of this year, um, 2017, I had an event at Barnes and Noble and, um, I invited them just to be polite, but I didn't want to, I'd never expected that any of them would come and just cause they live so far away. Uh, I think there were over 20 family members in the audience that night. They'd flown in from from Brazil and from France and all over the States. And um, of the five Kirk siblings, four were there represented by children, grandchildren, and then even a great-grandchild. So I think that that kind of just goes to show how how thrilled and excited and grateful they all are, as I am, for the help that they provided along the way. <laughs> I, I can only imagine. Um, a after working on the book for as long as you did, with all of the research that you did and the the years of, of uh, you know, the detective work and all that, what what was that feeling like uh, when you submitted the manuscript and it was kind of out of your hands finally? Oh, it was certainly terrifying. Um, it was terrifying because it's such a personal story. Um, and you're like, gosh, what if people don't like it? And it's my family. It's not like it's pure fiction. It's like my family's story. But on the flip side, it almost gave me that sense of like, you know what? I, I've done everything I can to tell this story in the best way I possibly can think of. And, and it is my family story. It's not like I can, it's not like I made up characters or made up events. So in a way it kind of took the pressure off, if you know what I mean? Like it's not, um, and again, I kind of go back to the whole reason why I wrote it in the first place is for the family. So in a sense, um, it just is like I'm on the cake to know that it's being so well received and resonating with so many people um, because really it was such a personal endeavor from the very get go. So I'm, I'm blown away by the response that it's gotten. Um, I'm glad it has, I suppose if it got a really negative response, then maybe I'd feel differently, but I do kind of feel like I went into it feeling like you know, when you, when you put your all into something, it's a great feeling because it's not like you're going to regret it, even if people don't receive it the way you'd hoped. And because it was such a, you know, it's just this legacy now in our family and it will get passed down and someday my, my great, great, great grandchildren will read it. Like that alone is enough for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, there have been a number of books uh, this year that have come out, uh, and, and I've had a number of the authors on the show and uh, that have written books um, 
in this time period and, and based around the Holocaust and, and uh, uh, World War II, uh, Mark Sullivan's Beneath the Scarlet Sky, Martha Hall Kelly's Lilac Girls, uh, Pam Jenoff's Orph- Orphan's Tale, uh, The German Girl by Armando Lucas Correa, uh, a number of really, really great books that are dealing with the, the human kind of fallout of of this time period and the, the events surrounding that. Um, do you feel like that there's some sort of a groundswell um, happening in, in, in us as a culture, maybe um, us as a people where these stories uh, like we're really digging to, to find these out maybe before they're all gone. Um, it, it just seems like there's a, there's a, um, uh, I, I can't even give it a word, but th- there's a, a, a need to hear these stories. Um, do, do you feel like that? I completely agree. I feel like it, there's so many stories and a lot of them, interestingly, are also written by third generation um, survivors. Exactly. So, yeah. It's exactly. like skipped generation phenomena. And I think that maybe partly goes back to the first generation not really wanting to relive it. The second generation was still very close to it. I mean, my mom was born two years after the war ended, you know, so it's, it's it took that third generation, maybe the distance to, or maybe the, we were a little bit more able to have the courage to ask the questions. And by then enough time had passed that, that, that the ancestors were willing to answer those questions. Um, and I do think there's a little that definitely a sense of, urgency today more than ever as we are fewer there are fewer and fewer survivors left to to tell those stories so I think now is sort of like the most important time to keep the stories alive now and moving forward Um, but I I agree I mean it's a little daunting uh, to to put your book out there knowing that it's just like this ocean of similar titles Um, but they all and people are still reading them and I do think there's that just like fascination now more than ever with uh, what was it really like, like you said, on a human level to experience it? And and part of that goes too. I think you know when we learn about that, particularly the Holocaust, it's really hard to to fathom what six million means. You know, how do you how do you put how do you humanize that? How does it? So I think for these, you know, like Pam Jenoff and one of my absolute favorite um, World War II novels is The Invisible Bridge by Julie Oranger. And that's also based on her grandfather's story. Um, you know, it just really, it puts you in the shoes of these real people going, experiencing it like as if you were there. And then it just makes it so much more meaningful and memorable and relevant in a way. What I, what I find interesting, Georgia, is that, um, you know, when a, when a genre becomes popular and say, um, uh, post-apocalyptic dystopian or whatever. So we yeah. get Hunger Games and we get, um, uh, you know, name name six dozen other derivatives, you know, that that all kind of came out and flooded the market to to hit that, to, to scratch that itch that we had for, you know, dystopia. Uh, and then those things burn out and, and, you know, the readership moves on to the next hot thing or whatever. Um, what I've what I've found is that yes, there have been a number of of books like this that have come out the last year or two, but they're not uh, derivative and they don't seem to be informed by each other. They seem to be informed by by this desire in us to want to know more. Um, yeah. So that that's what I found really intriguing is that it's it's not that, because each of these are deeply personal stories mm-hmm. and and not uh, okay people are buying you know World War Two Holocaust survivor stories let's go write one of those mm-hmm. and then you, you crack open your book and this is not something you could desire to write this is something that had to uh, be born out of uh, out of the 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 actual human drama of what happened. Yeah, right. It is. It's fascinating. And I agree. And it's, you, you might think that, um, people might get tired of, of it, but that does not seem the case, seem to be the case. Like you said, I think people are just craving it almost. And I, and then, and it is because this, these are very personal stories and they are most of the, the titles that you mentioned, these also are historical fiction. So it's just this, it's so rewarding, I think, for a reader to pick up a book. And maybe some of the titles aren't based as closely on truth as mine, but they are. They have aspects of truth, of what this is what was going on. Uh, Pam Jedos, The Orphan's Tale. I mean, there were 
boxcars full of babies. And there was this circus, German circus that was harboring Jews. Like it's fascinating. And it's stories that people often haven't heard before. Um, so you're right. People aren't trying to fill up the genre. They're just writing from a passion perspective. And that's probably why it's so successful. Probably so. Um, your book is absolutely fantastic. Uh, we were the lucky ones is the name of the book. I'm going to send everybody to pick up a copy of it. Um, what are you doing now, Georgia? <laughs> well, I have a newborn at home, I guess maybe technically not new, but he's almost eight months and oh, congratulations. mommy duty for the last eight. Oh, and it's been, thank you. It's been so much fun. I have a six year old too. So that's been interesting juggling the two of them, <laughs> but I'm about to hit the road again. And my paperback comes out January 2nd and I'm going to go on a national tour. I'm going to be out in California and Texas, Georgia, Florida. Um, I've got the whole event listed up on my website. If you're interested in, in, coming to visit me on one of my events. And um, from there, eventually I'll have time to think about what I want to write next. <laughs> Excellent. George, um, I, I can't recommend uh, your book enough. And uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Oh my gosh, this was really fun. Thanks again for having me. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Happy New Year! The crowd cheered and hooted. They raised glasses and blue noisemakers. The nets above broke and a cluster of red, white, and blue balloons fell. The Tom Yellen Orchestra sloshed into Auld Lang Syne, as tipsy and sentimental as mourners at a wake. When he was a boy... Hedwig's grandmother had preferred her own version of that song, alternate lyrics stolen from an old poem. He tried to recall them, but couldn't. He watched the kissing couples with pity. They didn't know how things never worked out, did they? And then his eye fell on Jessica. She was laughing, playing slow-motion paddle ball with a red balloon. And that's when the voice of his grandmother finally came, singing in the rude shelters of his boyhood grateful to have survived another year. Should old acquaintance be forgot and never thought upon, the flames of love extinguished and fully passed and gone, is thy sweetheart now grown so cold that loving breast of thine that thou canst never once reflect on old Lang Syne. On old Lang Syne, my Joe, on old Lang Syne, that thou canst never once reflect on old Lang Syne. Something caught in his throat. This was a very old memory. He didn't like those, or the emotions they brought. He was a different person now. Jessica was staring at him. She'd caught the red balloon and was holding it to her bosom. She walked right up to him, put her hand on the back of his neck, and kissed him deeply. Their bodies pressed together and the balloon burst between them. What was that for? said Hedwig, staggering back. Curiosity. She brushed the scrap of balloon from his jacket. And it was just as good as I remembered. Hedwig's surge of pleasure paused at half-mast. She might not have meant it as a compliment.